Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see so many people in real life <laughs> still coming back from the pandemic. And I heard that the party was fun last night. Is that right? That sounds great. I'm glad you all had a wonderful time. I was joking with some folks at breakfast this morning that there's nothing to sober everyone up like a after breakfast discussion on geopolitics. <laughs> it's a pretty complicated world right now, but unfortunately we can no longer ignore what's happening beyond our borders, so SIOR asked me to come and speak to you a little bit this morning about what's happening behind the headlines. You hear so much about what's happening in China, in Russia, in the Middle East, in Latin America, but how does that impact all of us right here in the US and in Canada? So we're gonna do a little bit of that. I'm gonna keep my remarks fairly short and I'd love to just have a conversation with you afterwards. Nothing's off limits. We deal with the whole world and I'd love to just chat with you about whatever is on your mind. So if I had to give one summary for how to see the world right now, it's that great powers are acting badly. We're seeing the biggest tectonic shift in the international system really since the end of the Cold War and certainly since 9-11 and the terrorist attacks on our country. And so um, have a little thought for the people in Washington who are working hard every day to keep us all safe. When I say great powers are acting badly, I really mean China and Russia. So let me start a little bit with what's going on inside China and then tell you what's happening with US-China relations. You'll hear a lot about balloons these days, <laughs> spy balloons flying over our territory. But what's going on beyond all that? And we don't look very much at what's happening inside China. Last fall, Xi Jinping uh, was elected as the leader of China for a third term, which is really unprecedented in the Chinese system. He came to power in 2012, and he has increasingly consolidated his power so that China is now not just an authoritarian state, but increasingly a totalitarian one. There's really almost no room for dissent. I'll give you one story. I used to travel to China six, seven times a year. The last time I was there, right before the pandemic, I had two Chinese friends who I would normally, I know them well enough that I'd go to their house for tea, meet their kids, go over for dinner. Not one, but both of them said in the beginning of 2020, Anya, we're so happy you're here. Would love to see you. Let's take a walk and please don't bring your cell phone. So it's not okay for Chinese people to be friends with Americans anymore, especially Americans that at some point worked in the US government. It's a really a sad state of affairs. You saw maybe in the news that a Taiwanese, not even a Chinese, but a Taiwanese, book editor was recently detained when he was on a visit to mainland China. So that tells you a little bit about how rigid the system has become. There's been an enormous crackdown even on Chinese, China's own companies. They're big tech companies that were doing extraordinarily well that are really competitive internationally. So people are worried and they're tense and they're being very closed. Um, what you've seen in the last six months is first Xi Jinping elected, elected, appointed to another term. And now in the spring, what they call the two sessions, you have him set up what is essentially the equivalent of a cabinet. All of those people are loyalists to Xi Jinping. They also, in a lot of cases, have run big successful provinces, like his number two, the new premier, used to run, run Shanghai, was enormously successful at that. But leave no doubt that politics and national security is gonna trump any sort of view on economic growth in China for the near future. Let's talk about China's economy. For the past decade or so, everyone has said this is the engine of world economic growth. It just couldn't slow down. You know, they were growing at 10, 12% a year. That all stopped abruptly with the extraordinary crackdowns during COVID. I mean, we all lived through some lockdowns, nothing like what you saw in China. 
you would see traffic circles. I have this visual in my mind of this enormous traffic circle in Beijing where you would have a thousand cars every couple of minutes, just empty, not one person. Uh, you had what the Chinese call big whites, people who would, went around in hazmat suits and sort of locked people back in their apartment buildings. You had Chinese nationals who worked for American companies that our companies had to deliver food to because they literally weren't allowed to leave their apartment buildings except once a week to go shopping. So if you think we had lockdowns, even I live in California, we had some serious lockdowns, that was nothing like what happened in China. And so what you're seeing now and the protests you saw in the fall were really unprecedented. So even Xi Jinping had to relent and open up again and you're seeing the economy surging back just because people are allowed to leave their homes and allowed to consume and go to, um, go to the movies, <laughs> go out to restaurants, and so that's why you're seeing a lift in economic growth. But there are some longer-term trends in China uh, on the economy that aren't so positive, frankly, even especially compared to the United States. The Chinese population is actually, for the first time this year, shrinking. So they famously had the one-child policy implemented in the late 1970s because their population was growing too fast. If you're an authoritarian regime, you can say that. Now you could only have one child. So there's a whole generation, my generation, they're mostly only children. So when they're married, you've got two parents to take uh, care of, sometimes eight sets of, you know, two, so four parents. <laughs> eight sets of grandparents, and often they have two children. So that slows consumption. You have fewer and fewer people of working age in China taking care of all of their aged parents and grandparents. So what are you going to do? You probably will spend a little less and save every penny to make sure that you have something in case grandma gets sick. Those are all things that we don't think about when we think of China as this kind of inevitable juggernaut. And I sometimes worry about how China is portrayed in the US press, because we see it as sort of this juggernaut coming for us. They're 10 feet tall. They get all their policies right. That's not how it works. And we actually, a totalitarian system like the Chinese is very, very opaque. Um, my business partner, Condi Rice, always says, no one knew that the fall of the Soviet Union was going to happen when it did. We know equally little about China, and I think the Chinese don't even know. When I teach this at Stanford, I sometimes say systems like this are rigid. They're like glass. You can tap them 100 times, nothing happens. Tap it just the right way, and it shatters. So there's a chance that we'll see Xi Jinping in power for life, that you'll have this really rigid system, or there's a chance that in a few years, the Chinese will have had enough. Probably less likely that you have a Tiananmen Square type uprising, but maybe the people right below Xi Jinping say, OK, this is too much. We don't want this anymore. We're going to put someone in place who's a little more open to the world and a little more relaxed, like you had with previous Chinese leaders. So it's a hard time. Isn't necessarily going to always be that way. What does all of this mean for US-China relations? Boy, every time I stand up here giving one of these talks, I think it can't possibly get any worse in US-China relations, and then it does. <laughs> so I know friends of mine in Washington who work in the government were very eager to put what they call a floor under the downward spiral, to just say, hey, we're going to disagree with the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese people, but the Chinese Communist Party on a lot of things. But we need to talk to each other. We need to make sure there isn't an accident. And there was a meeting between President Biden and President Xi last November. And everyone thought, OK, now things will get better. Our Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, was about to go to China. And then what happens? Spy balloon. <laughs> and so you see this balloon flying over the United States. And what's our Secretary of State going to do? You can't go to China when they're doing something like that. And, and in case anyone is of any doubt, that this was really intentional and it really was a spy balloon. It flew right over our nuclear missile sites. Then it flew over the base from where we launch the nuclear missiles. Then it flew over the bomber sites. So it's pretty clear that they were collecting intelligence. 
So that has once again made things difficult on the political side. And I would say here, I'm American, so I would mostly blame the Chinese for being really stubborn on the political side. But the US has also been quite aggressive. If there's one thing that unites Republicans and Democrats in Washington, DC, it's that being tough on China is the right policy. I worry sometimes that that doesn't allow us to be as nuanced as we probably be, and it pushes us in a position that we may not necessarily want. Nobody wants a war with China. That's a terrible idea. And we should be able to find a way through without that. On the Chinese side, they're also being extremely aggressive, and particularly on the military side. When you see how many jets they're sending in every day to test Taiwanese airspace, how many ships are going around this contested area of the South China Sea, sometimes actually Chinese military ships, but sometimes sort of fishing boats that are supposedly civilian, but not really civilian. The worry that those of us who've served in government have is not about an intentional war, but that there is an accident, and then there's no one to call. Because unlike the Soviet Union all through the Cold War, where it was very clear if there's an accident, this general calls just general, this is how you resolve the issue, this is how you calm everything down, Every time the Chinese get annoyed at us, they stop talking. The US military finally had pretty good communications with their counterparts in the Chinese military. And after Nancy Pelosi visited, and then again after the spy balloon, they've all broken down. So let's say there's an accident between two fighter jets or an accident between two ships. It's something that we worry about that can spiral out of control. Depressed yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you with one silver lining. On the economic side, nobody likes to talk about it, but actually last year was a record year for US-China bilateral trade. It just isn't really in our news. So what you hear about all the time is the part of our trade that impacts national security and human rights. I live in California. Silicon Valley is hard hit by that. There is decoupling between the technology companies. And in my view, that's the right thing to do. If something touches the Chinese military, we certainly shouldn't be selling it to them. Uh, on semiconductors, we have some pretty tough new export controls in the US just to make sure that our innovation ecosystem stays ahead of what the Chinese are doing. And boy, they're pretty good, and they're developing really, really quickly. So that part is getting very difficult. If you're building semiconductors, hardware, any technology, and it has the word tech and China in it, it's probably gonna be a bad business going forward. But for so many of the companies, including the ones I advise in my firm, American companies, big CEOs, business is just fine in China. So if you're doing consumer goods, if you're Starbucks or even Walmart or um, other consumer goods companies, even the car companies, you're not doing so badly. If you're agriculture, I think a lot of you are from the Midwest. I give a talk recently to our soybean farmers. Their business is going gangbusters in China, and the Chinese are, of course, selling to us. And in my view, that's a very positive thing. You need those linkages to stay alive, to, to, to remain, because we actually don't want hot conflict here. Let me leave it there. If people have, want to dig in further on any of these issues, I'm happy to discuss it later in the question session. Let me move now to another hop, happy topic, which is Russia. And really, when you say great powers are acting badly, we mean Vladimir Putin. Um, he is isolated. He is a dictator. He's pretty erratic. You can see it even when you see him meeting with his own people. He's sort of physically distanced. He's far away at the end of the table, there at the other end. You can often see that they appear terrified of him. And of course, he shut down all dissent. Now, Vladimir Putin and his propaganda machine is making a lot of noises that the outrageous invasion of Ukraine that happened a little over a year ago, 
was because of NATO expansion, because of all these things. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. And let me tell you one story that Condi Rice, my business partner, tells when she was with Putin. This is now years ago. But he leaned to her and he said, Condi, you know us. You speak Russian. Russia is only great when it's run by great men. Peter the Great, Tsar Alexander. And then he stops. And Condi thinks, oh, and you mean Vladimir the Great. That's what this is about. He is a Russian nationalist, and he wants to reconstitute what he sees as greater Russia. So that means not all of the former Soviet Union, but it certainly means Belarus. He's basically done that. And it means Ukraine. And so that invasion last year, the Russians went in there with three days of supplies and with their dress uniforms. They thought they would be welcomed with open arms and have the victory parade. Well, turns out that didn't happen. The Ukrainians stood up. They have been extraordinarily courageous. And I have to give a silver, every time I'm going to say something positive here, I'm going to point it out, because <laughs> the, the system is so depressing right now. Here's one really positive thing that's come out of this horrible invasion. I have never seen, in my decades of working on foreign policy, the United States and Europe so united, Democrats and Republicans in Washington so united on an issue. You hear a few outliers, but by and large, they support Ukraine. And the United States government and the business community so united. When this invasion happened last year, we personally helped a lot of American CEOs and boards think through this to a person. They did the right thing. They went way beyond what the sanctions required. A lot of them left Russia immediately, did the right thing for their Russian employees, did the right thing for their Ukrainian employees, supplied humanitarian aid. It's really a good story that isn't told often enough. So what happens now? We're a, war, we're a year into this horrible conflict. And I hate to tell you, but the most likely outcome here is a very long slog. So the way I think about it is that you have two competing timelines. On the one hand, you have the Ukrainians, smaller country, smaller economy, fighting for their homeland incredibly bravely. And the question is, how far and how fast can the West, mostly the US, but also our European friends, get the right military materiel in there? to make sure that the Ukrainians can launch a counteroffensive. So you heard a lot about the tanks. Now we're talking about fighter aircraft. We're talking about munitions. I see this because I serve on the main advisory board to the Pentagon. I don't speak for the Pentagon. But I see how hard people in our military are working to do the right thing and get the right equipment to Ukraine. So it's moving, but these things take time. The second timeline is how fast can Vladimir Putin get his poor recruits, 300,000 people that they called up last fall, ill-trained, ill-equipped, how fast can he get them into the fight to essentially be cannon fodder? And the hard thing is that Putin thinks that time is on his side. And he may be right. Russia has three times as many people as Ukraine. The Russian people are used to hardship and suffering. They're used to 20, 30 percent inflation. They're used to their economy not being very good. Our sanctions have been really pretty powerful. But even then, with oil prices spiking, the Russian economy was roughly even last year. It didn't even shrink very much. So unfortunately, Putin might be right that this drags on for another year or two or three. Time actually might be on his side. Now, the best thing that we can hope for here is that the Ukrainians really do well in their counteroffensive this spring. You fight to something that looks like a draw, and then it forces people to concentrate minds and really come to the negotiating table. So let's hope that happens, but it's far from certain. Another important thing to discuss here is China and Russia's, quote, no limits friendship and how that relates to this. So historically, the Chinese and Russians haven't trusted each other very much, to the point that uh, when Bob Gates, my other business partner, was a young staffer in the White House, 
there was a conflict, a small border conflict between Russia and China. And the Russians actually called Washington and said, would you mind if we just put a little nuclear bomb on the Chinese? And we said, yeah, yeah, we would mind. That's a really terrible idea. Right? Now, we've come a long way from that to a no limits friendship. And I think it is true that Xi and Putin in particular get along. It's not so true, and the militaries are cooperating a lot. It's not so true that the Chinese and the Russian peoples get along particularly well. I had an interesting conversation actually with a Chinese real estate investor. This is now going back maybe two years during the pandemic. And I said, so you're doing a lot with Russia. Are you investing in Russia? And he said to me, oh, no, no, no. There's no rule of law there, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> On the military side, you don't yet see the Chinese delivering weapons to Russia to help them. They're staying a little carefully under that threshold. But boy, you see a lot of dual use goods, a lot of semiconductor chips, a lot of aluminum oxide, which is used for body armor. And you see the Russians being increasingly good about going around the really impressive sanctions that the West has put in place. So what did the West do last year? sanction almost every technological good export controlled. So you can't send chips, you can't send anything that would at all help the Russian military to Russia. That worked for a while. Now you're seeing really weird workarounds. Like suddenly there is a huge upsurge in refrigerators being ordered in Kazakhstan coming from South Korea. What are they doing? Taking the refrigerators apart, taking the microchips out, and putting it in weapon systems in Russia. So you're seeing that kind of thing. So sanctions erode over time. What does all this mean for this sector and for all of you? Unfortunately, I think it means that inflation is going to continue to be really pretty strong. And especially on the energy side, agricultural goods, which don't impact you that directly. But it's going to be very hard. Only some of the inflation that you're seeing now, which is causing the much higher interest rates, is caused by our own overstimulus of our economy. A lot of it is because of this geopolitical turmoil that you're seeing, and that energy prices and food prices are going to continue to be really high. As I finish kind of the point on Russia and China, I also want to say, I think your sector will also be positively impacted by what you're seeing, by what's kind of the, uh, the difficult relations between the US and China. Because you know, I talked about the tech sector decoupling. We're not reshoring everything back to the United States, but I have been surprised at how much of those supply chains are moving outside of China. Often it's Malaysia, it's India, it's everywhere. But also you see some of those factories coming back here. I mean, when you look at just the CHIPS Act and the semiconductor fabs that are about to be built here in the United States. In the last few months, Micron announced that they're going to build the largest chip factory in US history in, up, in upstate New York. TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, is building one huge fab, in, which is a big factory that makes the semiconductor chips in Arizona. They're about to start on another one. Intel announced that they're doing a huge amount in Ohio. So I know the industrial real estate market has already been really a bright spot. And I think, especially as it pertains to things that are related to technology, that's likely to continue. Let me move. We're moving across the whole world here. We're, we're moving from east to west. So we've talked about China. We've talked about Russia. Let me go a little bit and talk about how all of this impacts Europe. The Russian war has had a huge impact on the European economy in particular. Inflation is still pretty high. Consumption is weak. Frankly, we've all been really positively surprised by how much, um, how resilient the Europeans have been and how they've been resolved to do the best and how quickly they've moved away from using Russian oil and gas. It's been really impressive. But of course, it means that it's difficult. Factories in Germany, I'm German originally, so I'm very excited about your Berlin event. You should all definitely go. <laughs> but factories in Germany, whew, 
but factories in Germany have been sometimes not being able to run at full shifts. They've had to switch back to coal because there isn't the oil and gas to run them. They got pretty well through last winter, frankly, partly helped because it was a very warm winter. Um, but this year, as this long slog of a war continues, people are a little bit worried. And there's one more thing that's going on with the European economy that has everyone up in arms. I was in Brussels two months ago. Uh, leave it to us, to the US and Europe, to have the tyranny of petty differences, as I like to call it. When the Biden administration pushed through the Inflation Reduction Act, it has a lot of incentives to put clean energy factories and other things here in the United States. The Europeans are up in arms about that because, of course, that will impact them. And they're actually not wrong, but I think it's something that could benefit you all and your sector. So if you look at what's already been announced, Tesla is shifting away from Europe, is going to do more of its manufacturing here in the US. Swedish battery maker Northvolt, German chemical giant Linda, Volkswagen, the Italian energy company Enel, and others are all exploring finding facilities here in the United States, getting subsidies under the Inflation Reduction Act, and moving maybe some of that production out of Europe. So that makes the Europeans unhappy, but it's probably pretty good for you all and everything you're doing. Um, I'll leave Europe there, and we can't discuss the whole world today, but I would be remiss if I didn't say a few words about what's happening in the Middle East. It dominated the headlines for so many years, and now really you hear very little about it. And the news coming out of there can be really bewildering. What's going on with Saudi? Why are they suddenly friends with the Chinese? Why is there a war in Yemen? What's happening in Syria? The way I think about it to cut through all of that complication is, is this way. The French and the British, Sykes and Pico, drew some really arbitrary lines in that part of the world at the end of World War I. Every time in international politics when you see straight line borders, you often have a problem <laughs> because it cut through tribal loyalties, it cut through religious loyalties between Shia and Sunni. And what you're seeing now in the Middle East, all of these wars, Iraq falling apart, Syria, what's happening in Yemen, is kind of a generational rejiggering of those alliances, often between Shia and Sunni, but often also between different tribes. So that's how I think about it generally. Amazingly, in spite of all that, there's some pretty positive news. A few years ago, uh, under the Trump administration, the Abraham Accords were signed. An unbelievably impressive deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, which is probably the most sophisticated country economically in the Middle East, not yet Saudi Arabia, but also Bahrain, Morocco has now joined. And it's not a political deal, it's really economic. I'm in that part of the world all the time, I was just there about a month ago, and people want to invest in each other. They're tired of fighting. The number of calls I get from Israeli venture capitalists saying, hey, are there some cool young startups in Bahrain or in Dubai that I can invest in? It's real, right? A mosque, a mosque is being built right next to a synagogue in Abu Dhabi. There's some pretty good stuff happening that you often don't hear about. And the Middle East is trying to calm things down. Both Saudi Arabia, which of course is the biggest, the behemoth country there, and the Emirates, which is the most sophisticated economically, are really trying to move away from being only dependent on oil. They want to diversify their economies, and that means they want to make peace. They don't want to be fighting with everyone all the time. So you see the Saudis trying to, they got the Chinese involved, we'll see how strong it is, but trying to tamp down the conflict with Iran. You see the Abraham Accords with Israel. You see people calming down. And you see one more thing, which is pretty important to us. The whole region is starting to take us as our, at our word. This is a nonpartisan statement, but three US presidents in a row have said they want to pivot away from the Middle East and don't want to be bogged down there anymore. And now we're surprised that the region is hedging its bets. They said, OK, you don't want to be involved here. We're going to talk to the Chinese. We're going to talk to the Russians. 
they'll still work with us and they'll still be our security partners. Our companies are doing really good business there. But it does mean that China is now the region's most important trading partner by far. By the way, China is the most important trading partner of something like 110 countries around the world. We're a fraction of that. So the Chinese are not isolating themselves. We're the ones who have no trade policy. <laughs> but so China is really important in the region economically. And, you know, they are looking out for number one. So you saw this big kerfuffle between the Saudis and the Biden administration over oil prices. Well, OPEC is always going to take care of itself first. Higher oil prices help them stabilize their economies. And so this, again, impacts you. So in the near and medium term, oil prices are probably going to stay pretty high, led by Saudi Arabia. And that, again, is going to influence the energy you get into your buildings, influence inflation in general, and of course, then impact interest rates. But overall, it's not um, an entirely negative picture. So you all depressed yet? <laughs> Let me leave you with a couple of bright spots that are sometimes overlooked. There is actually a lot that's going well. If you look at India, it has expected to have the fastest economic growth amongst large economies for the next five to seven years. They're growing at seven, eight percent a year. A lot of those, supply, not, not all of them, but some of those supply chains that are coming out of China are actually moving into India. Prime Minister Modi has done a really good job on economic reform. There are some complications with respect to his Hindu nationalist party and uh, restrictions on Muslims that are, that are problematic. But as a friend, we tell them that, you know, maybe we don't like the way you're acting in this particular way. But India has become an increasingly close friend and partner of the United States. Vietnam is doing exceptionally well one of Asia's star performers. Indonesia is doing really well. Rwanda, I was just in Africa right before Christmas. You know, when you hear the news in the United States about Africa, it's starvation and it's what's happening with the warlords in Sudan and all of those things are true. But what you see when you go to many of those cities are young people just trying to make it work. Having tech companies and startups and making films and being really not unlike all of our young people here. So there are really some bright spots. Let me leave you with a couple of overall takeaways. What you've heard from all of this turbulence and this wild ride is that the globalization that we took for granted for so long, that there were gonna be ever increasing open markets, freer movement of people, that pendulum is really swinging back. You have certainly, um, Globalization, it turns out, didn't benefit everyone. It benefited, the, one of the most startling statistics I've heard is that in the United States, uh, the average life expectancy for a white man who has a high school education or less is 10 years lower than all of you highly educated people in this room. So no wonder people are frustrated with globalization. And that's why you have movements like America first here in the US, but you see it everywhere else. You have Brazil first with Bolsonaro, India first with Modi, Turkey first with Erdogan. And that pendulum still hasn't swung quite all the way, but you can see it coming back to center. So what does that mean for business? The businesses I deal with, it means that instead of efficiency, which is what they talked about for a decade, now the catchword is resilience. We're going to have factories in Asia for Asia. We're going to have factories in North America for North America. We're going to be a little more careful about having backup if we may not be able to get our supplies. All of that, frankly, probably pretty helpful to you. So just to conclude, it's a wild world out there. Buckle your seat belts. It's going to continue to be a wild, wild ride. But the US has come out of far worse than this. We've been through the Great Depression. We've been through World War II. We've been to the social upheavals of the 1960s. And I think we're going to weather this one just fine. It sometimes feels like when you are listening to the hacks on television that you know we all hate each other. But that's not what I see. When I come and talk to 
you know, I had breakfast with a group of you this morning, and when I talk to other groups like this, most people are kind of in the common sense middle and just want people to do the right thing. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to come together to push for positive economic policy, good education, do the right thing for our country and the world. So I'll leave you there. Thank you. said, I'm very happy to take questions about any part of the world that we haven't discussed, or really anything at all, if you have any. Are you a Peter Zion fan? I don't know who that is. Should I be? He is saying that China, and because of their one kid policy, is very much on a down slide, downhill slide, and he thinks everybody's going to want out of China ah. because of communism and everything else, and we're going to have great insurance. Do you agree? Um, partially. So yes, but all of these trends always seem extreme when you draw a straight line, but then they aren't. When you drew a straight line 10 years ago, it was China was going to have 2 billion people and they were going to take everything over. They'll find some ways to adjust. But yes, of course, the, demog the demographics is pretty hard. Yeah, sorry, sir. Uh, thank you for the information for uh, the China and Russia connection as well as the war in Ukraine, uh, European kind of economic standpoint. Could you talk a little bit about, kind of touch on what's going on with Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think that may be pretty important for the folks here. Uh, bring it a little closer to home. We'll keep moving west. Uh, so if you could touch on what's going on with Washington, D.C. from an economic standpoint, as well as how it relates to the real estate industry and more specifically to the commercial real estate industry, kind of economic-wise in America. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Perfect question. What's going on in Washington, D.C.? The biggest geopolitical threat of all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank God we're off the record. <laughs> no, I have to tell you, it's, it's a serious question, and it deserves a serious answer. But um, Bob Gates, my business partner, always says, corny joke, but I'll tell it anyway, if the opposite of pro is con, the opposite of progress is Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that about sums it up. I mean, you look at what they're doing, and you just, I came from Washington, I was there yesterday, and it's just not the country I recognize. You know, people are shouting at each other. You see people playing politics with the national debt. Yes, we need to get the national debt under control, but not by holding the full faith and credit of the United States hostage, right? Can't all of us in this room probably think of some reasonable compromises on immigration, on environmental issues, on all of these things, and yet I worry that people are screaming about things that don't affect most of us day to day. You know, you're screaming about wokeism and abortion and all of these things, and I look at, at my life and my kids, and I think, can you just solve education, maybe? <laughs> can you just worry about what actually worries us here at home? and just have a little stability. So I think if all of us somewhere in the common sense middle get out there and vote, hopefully it'll get better. Thanks. Sir. Hi, yes, thank you. I was wondering, um, our progressive liberal wing of the Democrat Party has traditionally been very anti-war, going back through Iraq, Afghanistan, and even all the way back to Vietnam protests. Why is it now that we see that element most supportive of arming uh, Ukraine with missiles and tanks as we fight the proxy war against Russia through Ukraine? Yeah, what a good question. You know, the, the, the anti-war left has sort of disappeared a little bit. I think it's partly that you're more comfortable doing what you're, if, if the president is from your party. I, I think if you had a Republican president, you might have the Democrats more concerned. But I think actually um, what you're seeing on foreign policy is you're seeing the centrist middle, moderate Republicans and Democrats sort of holding out against the really isolationist far left and far right. So you had a bunch of the far lefties, sort of the AOCs and others, write a letter saying, why are we helping these Ukrainians? And you think, well, because they're fighting for their lives. This is like Churchill in, <laughs> in World War II. These are the people standing between you and the dictator winning. And they're not asking us to fight. And actually, the thing that makes me supportive of this policy 
And it's not a no-cost policy. You know, we've voted $50 billion in assistance for the Ukrainians. That's a huge chunk of money. But the US Pentagon spends $800 billion a year. So maybe we should be spending less than that. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's in the scope of what the US government spends. It's not an insane amount. And it keeps our boys and girls from fighting there. And so that's why I firmly believe in the policy. And the, the, just to get to your point, the, there is a part of the woke left, as you put it, that's opposed to this. They've been kind of tamped down by the White House. And of course, there's an isolationist right, which is why Kevin McCarthy had to get up there and say no blank checks and things. But so far, both parties have quieted those isolationist elements. Yeah. Got lots of questions. Anya, Great. thank you for your thoughtful comments this morning. Uh, you talked about China's impact on the Middle East uh, and the fact that they're the important uh, trading partner for over 100 countries. But it's been 10 years now since they initiated their Belt and Road Initiative. The what initiative? Sorry. Their Belt, Belt and Road oh, Initiative. Belt and Road, yeah. Uh, back in 2000. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that is going and where it's likely to go, particularly in strategic locations like the Panama Canal? Absolutely. The Belt and Road Initiative, this is a very important issue. Um, so this is the Chinese essentially 10 years ago um, exported their overcapacity. Uh, every, if you've been to China, as I'm sure many of you have, every airport is gleaming, every road and bridge is built. And boy, do they have a lot of steel, cement, aluminum companies, most of them state-owned enterprises. So what do you do? You export that overcapacity. And so it was a pretty good um, policy for a while. Because by the way, this isn't aid. It's always sold by the Chinese as aid. They used to be concessionary loans. Now they're loans that are pretty much market rate. And they say, OK, we'll build your port. And if you can't pay us back, eventually we'll own that port. <laughs> so it, it's been successful, not quite as wildly successful as the US press sometimes shouts about, because you actually see um, countries moving back from it. South Africa is a great example. South Africa went all in on the Belt and Road. There was probably quite a bit of corruption there, You know, the Chinese paying off, the people in power. And then the South Africans said, this is outrageous. You're building this with Chinese labor. We're not getting any benefit. We're not getting any jobs. You're not having any environmental restrictions around this. And by the way, our people in power are getting rich. So they voted those guys out. And now they're a little bit more hesitant about the Chinese. So you see this tension. The part of the Belt and Road that I worry most about is what they call the digital Silk Road, where basically any dictator that wants it can now get Huawei, they can get Hikvision, they can get all sorts of surveillance technology to create kind of an Orwellian surveillance state just like they have in China. So that's what worries me most. Thanks. Sir. So when COVID hit, we saw just chaos happen in our supply chains. We did. We still import almost $600 billion worth of stuff from China every year. They hold you know, almost a trillion dollars worth of our T-bill debt. You know, whether it's through our own sanctions, short of military escalation with them, but sh you know, if we do sanctions intentionally against them or if they intentionally want to play havoc with our financial systems, what do you think the risk? You know, I see the stock market just going on as though nothing is really happening, but I think maybe there's more risk there. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Great question. So the question is, wow, they hold a huge amount of our debt and they sell us a lot of stuff. The supply chain snafus were unbelievable during COVID. I mean, we all lived it, and we realized just how dependent we are on China, and frankly, just how dependent we are on this very well-choreographed ballet that was international shipping. And once you put a cog in one wheel, suddenly everything doesn't work anymore. You know, I have to tell you, I worry a lot about China, and I worry a little bit less about those two issues. Them holding our debt is kind of mutually assured destruction. If they sell it, all of a sudden it tanks their economy just as much as it tanks ours. You can see them having sold it down gradually, which is probably a good thing, and that will likely continue. And on the trade of normal goods, ones that aren't, don't touch national security or human rights or are really important for our own healthcare system, like we realized how dependent we were for them for pharmaceutical things, I think there's a bipartisan consensus that we got to get that right 
and we are working on it and not being so dependent on them. But if they send us toys, and if the iPhones are made there, and agricultural goods, my point is that my view is firmly that trade is important and positive and actually helps prevent war. So I worry less about that trade in ordinary goods that doesn't touch our national security. Thanks. So I see we're out of time and we had a lot of questions left. Can I go five minutes long? Am I keeping us late? Or? One more question. Okay, last question. Do you think that China's population will get rich before it gets old? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I don't think so. That's not the trajectory, and this gentleman asked it right here. Uh, they're getting old pretty fast. The, the population is declining, and you, when you go to China, there's this huge difference. When you go to Shanghai or Hong Kong, which is now mainland China, or Beijing, these are gleaming cities. They're amazing, and their income level is about what you would see in Europe or in the US, income per capita. When you go to the hinterlands, it is still a developing country. And so the question is, which Chinese will get rich? Some certainly have, but not all 1.3 billion of them. Some of those will get old before they get wealthy. Yeah. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Thank you all.